And without further ado, patient-centered care, use of dietary supplements in cancer patients with Amanda H. Corbett, PharmD, BCPS, and FCCP. And uh, Dr. Corbett, welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much. I'm very excited to be here with you all. Well, we are, we are definitely excited to have you. Let's, let's give our audience a little bit of information about you, and you can tell me if I've got this right. Assistant Dean for the, for the Professional Curriculum and Associate Director of Global, Global Engagement and Clinical Associate Professor at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Eshelman School of Pharmacy. Board Certified Pharmacotherapy, a Fellow of the American College of Clinical Pharmacy, and a Fellow of the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine. Am I doing okay so far? Yeah, sounds great. Great. Contributions as a faculty member have been in teaching, research, and clinical practice. Current contributions are in leading Doctor of Pharmacy curriculum, participating in the school's global engagement efforts, conducting teaching and research in integrative medicine, where she has completed a two-year fellowship training in 2019, published more than 100 peer-reviewed manuscripts, abstracts, reviews, and book chapters, presented to more than 65 national and international audiences, and is proudly a yoga teacher and Reiki master and a student of herbal medicine. That's quite a set of accomplishments. What's, what's maybe one other thing we should know about you in addition to that, that long list? Wow, so many, so many things. Um, I would say something personally ab about me. Uh, just recently, our family adopted a brand new puppy, and oh. I'm hoping she's going to be quiet and, and um, cooperative during our hour. Uh, her name is Luna. She's an Italian Greyhound mix. Um, so if you do hear a little whining, it's her. She may have to hop up <laughs> on my lap, but we're going to do our best um, to continue, and I'm sure we'll, it'll be a, a nice adventure. Great. Well, we're going to hope Luna does hop in your lap because we'd love to see her. <laughs> So, um, that, the congratulations. Good job. Thank you. Now, I did mention Poll Everywhere. Uh, it's completely anonymous, so uh, we encourage everyone to go ahead and participate with this. Our first question will pop up in just a minute, and it's cancer patients should talk to their oncology providers, physician, pharmacist, et cetera, about their use of dietary supplements during cancer treatment. Now, as you know, if you've been here before, this first one is kind of a softball, but A, true, or B, false. And while you're thinking about that, this activity has been planned and implemented under the sole supervision of the course directors in association with the UNC Office of Continuing Professional Development. William Wood, MD, MPH, and CPD staff have no relevant financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. Amanda H. Corbett, PharmD, BCPS, FCCP has no financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. Whew. Okay. And so now that poll is live, um, take about 10, 15 seconds if you would. Again, cancer patients should talk to their oncology providers, physician, pharmacist, et cetera, about their use of dietary supplements during cancer treatment. Now, Amanda, we have a very sharp audience and uh, I'm gonna guess they're right on target again today. How are they doing? Looking good. Great. Great. So, all right. Yep. Well, I'm going to pass the baton off to you. Safe use of dietary supplements in cancer patients. And uh, it's all yours. Great. Thanks, Tim. Um, so, as demonstrated, it sounds like you guys are on top of it. And 100% of you did suggest that patients should talk with their providers, um, ideally before they initiate any sort of cancer treatment. Um, in a moment, we'll get into some more information around specifically, at least in the data and surveys, how many uh, cancer patients tend to use dietary supplements. I'm sure you all have guessed lots of them, and that, that is the case. Um, but just to start out, it is, good, it is good to know, and there's several reasons why. Um, it is good for providers to know if patients are planning to or are currently already taking any sort of dietary supplements. Um, and I wrote provider because that could be in lots of different forms, um, anywhere from the physician to a physician's assistant, uh, nurses, pharmacists, um, any of the above, uh, patient care coordinators, social workers. 
the idea is just to encourage patients to speak directly with their providers so that they do feel comfortable um, having those conversations with providers and being very upfront about um, their desire to use dietary supplements. So I won't give away any more data um, right now, um, but I did also just want to point out that um, it probably was not clear in my um, intro, and I've been a pharmacist for quite some time now. I am not a pharmacist or expert by any means in cancer care, cancer chemotherapy. Um, by far, I have lots of great friends and colleagues, many of you are likely um, on this call today, that do provide direct um, pharmacotherapy care or chemotherapy care directly to patients. So do keep that in mind. I'm really here just to focus on the dietary supplement component and how we can be supportive of cancer patients in that arena. Um, if you guys do have more specifics around chemotherapy and very specific questions around um, cancer care, I'll take notes of that, um, pass you along to some of my colleagues throughout the state in North Carolina, um, just to ensure that we do provide you all the most accurate information. My clinical background is in infectious diseases and mostly in HIV. Um, I haven't practiced in HIV in several years now, but there's, believe it or not, lots of similarities around caring for cancer patients and those with HIV when we um, are considering mostly around drug interactions and pharmacotherapy. Um, so that's often where that connection takes place. Uh, next slide, Tim. So just some brief objectives. I know we don't have a very long time um, together and we're gonna have some time at the end for you all to ask questions. But I really just wanted to talk pretty high level around dietary supplements. Some of this may be review for many of you, but I tend to find that if we're, if I'm able to provide you all resources and ways to answer questions or approach individualized patient care, that tends to be a lot more helpful than me just giving you a lot of data and information that could go out of date the minute that we step away from the screen today. Um, and in fact, some of it could already be out of date fact, factual information but the resources are really what are going to help you carry through for individualized patient care. So that's what I'll provide are really some key high level components as well as resources around safe use of dietary supplements. Um, I will provide some common uses of dietary supplements used by patients. Um, you know, with our limited time here, I'm not going to have a lot of time, really any, to go into detailed clinical trial data. Um, but just to give you an idea of where we are utilizing dietary supplements in cancer patients. And then finally, I know this is uh, a pretty popular topic, I will begin to introduce at least information around CBD and THC and kind of where that all fits into the conversation of um, use in cancer patients. Next slide. So just to step way back and make sure we're all on the same page um, to provide a definition around what, it, what even is a dietary supplement. So this was defined by the FDA, and I think of dietary supplements in categories. So one being uh, vitamins, which we're all familiar with, so ADEK and other water-soluble vitamins, such as B vitamins and C vitamins. Um, and then there's a category of minerals, so calcium, magnesium, sodium, et cetera. And then there's a very large umbrella category of non-vitamin, non-minerals. And within that category, you can think of plant-based products or often what is referred to as herbal products such as echinacea, elderberry, um, kava. So anything that comes from a plant per se, so a plant-based product or herbal product. And then as many of you know, there's this other category or within the non-vitamin, non-mineral um, category that would not necessarily be a plant or an herb, we have other products, um, very commonly used products, omega-3 uh, fatty acids or fish oils, glucosamines, lycopene, co CoQ10. So lots of this sort of category that really doesn't fit under a plant, a vitamin or a mineral. Next slide. So I don't think any of this is a surprise to many of you. There's um, a little bit of data that's published around consumer surveys and other surveys that give us a sense of how many 
adults or individuals actually take dietary supplements. And this is data from the U.S., um, several years old now. But we do know that a large percent of individuals, up to 75% of adults, uh, do take dietary supplements within the United States. So this is something of importance, probably not telling you anything you didn't already know, but just to provide some concrete um, data for you. Next slide. In addition to the general population, we also know that utilization of dietary supplements is fairly high within the cancer population also. So um, in some recent-ish recent in the past uh, four to five year survey, we do know that at least in, in a couple of publications that we've seen upwards of 70% of breast cancer patients utilizing dietary supplements, a little over a third of colon cancer patients and a, a very large percentage of about 85% of patients with gynecologic cancers. Um, also looking at the NHANES data, um, so this is a very large database many of you may be aware of, and looking at dietary supplement um, use between 2003 and 2016, we did find that a larger percent of individuals, about 70% of individuals with that were cancer survivors, we're using dietary supplements as opposed to a general population of about 50% um, that did not have cancer. So again, we know that this is indeed a population where dietary supplements is highly utilized. Next slide. Um, just to sort of, again, step back and give you all some uh, pearls for safe use of dietary supplements. Many of these are often obvious statements, but I feel like it's important to at least step away with some general concepts and summaries um, of just approaching people in general around using dietary supplements. I think of um, when I began my journey of learning about herbs and dietary supplements uh, well over a decade ago now, it was quite overwhelming. Um, it was really like relearning how to care for patients. So relearning pharmacy per se, so you're not in this world of prescription medications, it's an entire new approach to treatment. Um, and I would say, I, I went, as Tim introduced me, as a, a student of herbal medicine, I would still say that I'm absolutely a student of herbal medicine, even though I've been doing this for quite some time now. Um, there's just a lot to know. So it's not meant to be overwhelming, um, at least I hope not to everyone. Um, and just to utilize some of these approaches to think about um, care. So there is a potential and there's also many known risks for herb-drug interactions, especially in the population of cancer care. We know that there is um, a risk for drug-drug interactions already. And then when you add on top of that uh, dietary supplements, that contributes again to an, you know, another layer of potential for herb-drug interaction risks. That is not meant to be discouraging by any means to, to patients at all, um, nor to providers. It might seem a little bit overwhelming, but there's a growing amount of data of how we can really utilize herbs and medications safely. It's just to say that it is something that should not be ignored and should be considered when having a conversation with a patient. Um, choosing products from a reputable source Every time I look for additional product data around um, the quality of the product and how they're analyzed and described by manufacturers, I'm very impressed with the increased transparency across manufacturers. And we'll get into some of those specifics in a moment and how you might yourself um, determine if a, a, a product is uh, from a reputable source. Um, the next statement could be controversial for some, but I feel pretty strongly about this and from individuals that are aromatherapy experts, which I do not describe myself as one, um, but I do use essential oils personally and then with uh, patients and um, family members as well. But I would just overarching just say do not use recommended, do not use essential oils orally unless you are working with an expert in aromatherapy. Um, there are some examples where encapsulated uh, peppermint oil is an example for treatment of IBS or IBD um, that has been used and can be used safely if you have a reputable product. But in general, I think it's a, it's a good practice to um, 
just have a conversation with patients about just using them topically. And we'll get to in a moment how to safely use those topically as well. Um, cautions when using herbs for chronic conditions. My dear, dear teacher, uh, Taroni Lodog, some of you may know her. Um, she's a physician out in New Mexico who is an expert in integrative health. Um, you know, one approach that she uses, and I would say many of us use, is to think about herbs as, you know, they're active and they are not benign. Um, if used appropriately, they can have activity against whatever condition or symptom or um, um, illness that you may be discussing. So using them chronically should um, be used with caution and be used as monitoring as you would with medication. So just being very careful um, about how they are used chronically. And if they are about individuals, to please encourage those um, individuals to be monitored by a provider. Um, also considering duplication and therapeutic effects. So there's often um, a therapeutic effect with prescription medications. Um, there's often herbs that can mimic activity of what prescription product, prescription medications do. That's kind of the intent of using them as, as medicine. Um, so just knowing that if, you, for example, a patient is on a diabetic medication, if the herb also tends to affect blood glucose, then that could be a duplication effect. And it's also best to refer to an expert. I always get the question of, well, who are, how, who are those people and how do I find them? Um, I would just, you know, suggest that uh, you speak with anyone that, you, you know, I'm happy to refer you to someone locally if you need support. Um, any, especially in our cancer center, there are many, many individuals that are highly regarded. Um, some of them may be on the call today, and I'm happy to provide their names to you all if needed. Next slide. Um, so regulations of dietary supplements in the U.S. is very different than for prescription medications. I think most of us know this. Um, the FDA did uh, publish the DSHEA Act in 1994. I'm not going to go through any of these links today, but I can I promise you they're correct. Um, you can call me out. Feel free to if they're not, but I have checked each of them. But I did want to provide, again, resources for you all to refer to later if needed. So this link just gives you um, the link to the definition of the DSHEA Act, which defined the dietary, a dietary supplement. Um, and how to go about um, considering what it would be within the U.S. Um, there's statements of nutritional support, which will come up in a moment, about what's allowed on a, uh, to be marketed and uh, printed on a dietary supplement label. And then finally, good manufacturing process came along many, many years after the DSHEA Act was established. And the, the GMP process, which is under, it is required by prescription medication manufacturers, but technically is also required by dietary supplement manufacturers. And the FDA does have the right to go into a facility or to observe or test any dietary supplements that are manufactured within the U.S. And if, if they are, do not adhere to GMP, they can be uh, pulled from the market. Um, I'll just kind of stop there with that about regulation. Some of it's very boring to most folks, but I think it's important to know that the regulation is there, but it is quite different than prescription meds. Next slide. Um, many of you that have seen dietary supplement labels, either vitamins or minerals or herb-based products, um, there are regulations about what it can and cannot say. So the labels cannot claim to diagnose, mitigate, prevent, treat, or cure any specific disease. They can make statements about nutritional deficiencies around disease. They can make statements about effect of structure and function on well-being, for example. And they almost contain the statement that you'll see on this slide that's in italics on the label. Um, for example, you may see information around um, St. John's wort, a very common herbal product that does have quite a high risk of uh, drug or drug interactions. But you may see a label St. John's wort um, used for um, mood stability or utilized for individuals for any sort of um, uplifting of mood. So that is a very kind of generic approach. But what it would not be allowed, for example, is St. John's wort um, to be used for depression. 
So that would not be um, an allowed indication. And there are instances of where the FDA will um, require dietary supplement manufacturers to relabel and remarket their products if that if this does occur. Next slide. Fortunately, we have, as I've mentioned previously, there are a growing number of dietary supplement products that are evaluated by third parties. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of these sites because I think they're, they're extremely helpful. Um, USP or United States Pharmacopeia Convention, I just checked it this week. Um, that second, it's actually the second link down that says qualitysupplements.org, verified products. If you go to that site, that will give you the manufacturers as well as the specific products that are um, evaluated by USP and will um, be awarded the USP seal on their label. Uh, I just looked again this morning um, just in case something happens overnight because that's always possible. And in the past, I can say most of the USP approved products have been mostly vitamins and minerals. However, um, there are a growing number of herb-based products that are now uh, USP approved. Turmeric is one of those. Um, and then there's this other classification of non-vitamin, non-minerals, and those have been USP approved for a while. So there's some CoQ10s, melatonin, fish oil, um, saw palmetto, glucosamine, for example. So I would just encourage you to check out that list. It is a fairly limited list compared to the number of available dietary supplements. Um, but that's often the first place that I go uh, just to check out and make sure that there's, um, if, if the products are available, that they can be recommended to individuals. Um, Costco, as well as Sam's, has many of their products that are USP approved. Um, so also a price, um, a price as level as well that is perhaps more affordable. NSF International, that's a great link as well that provides a ton of uh, NSF certified products. Um, it is a little more comprehensive database, so you kind of need to know what you're looking for. If it's a specific herb or specific manufacturer, you can type that into the database and search, and that information will pop up. I will say the one that I use most often is Consumer Lab. If you have a few uh, fifty to hundred dollars a year, depending on the subscription that you purchase. Um, that you're willing to contribute to this endeavor, I would highly recommend Consumer Lab. It has um, not only dietary supplement information around safety and efficacy, including references, um, but also it provides a third-party evaluation of uh, dietary supplement products. And it's very clear in the way that they present their information in a table format to show you that indeed what the product states is on the label is actually in the product. It also does independent evaluation of heavy metals. Um, so I, I find that source to be uh, quite helpful. Next slide. All right, and this is one of our poll questions. So which of the following would ensure safe use of dietary supplements during cancer treatment? And uh, A would be learn the potential and or known risks of herb drug interactions. B, choose products from a reputable source. C, use any herbs whatsoever for chronic conditions. D, best refer to an expert. Or E, all of the above. So read that carefully. Uh, make sure that you're considering all of the options, uh, looking carefully at all of those options. And uh, let's take about another 10 seconds or so. Again, this is anonymous. And uh, Dr. Corbett, how are they doing? Looking great, yeah. Good, good. Uh, I, think, I think a few people might have missed C initially. And then uh, once, once you look at that one, you say, uh-oh, all of the above might not work. <laughs> Great. Anything else you want to say about the, the best refer to an expert? No, I think um, it's just really great that ideally, yes, I would recommend um, many of these options. Um, a for sure would be 
Um, we've already mentioned this, but there's a potential for herb drug interactions. Either you learning it or referring to an expert, which most of you are recommending, I think is the, is the best option by far. Um, it is true you could choose product, you should choose products from a reputable source. Um, but again, referring to an expert may be the better option. And no one picked, that's a good thing, use of herbs whatsoever for chronic conditions. Um, I think that's an obvious and correct answer, so that um, is helpful. Um, but just being cautious um, if you do have herbal use for chronic conditions as a reminder, making sure that patients are being monitored as they would for any other type of uh, treatment. Great. All right. Thanks so much. Okay, so as promised, I said we would talk a little bit more about essential oils because I know those are very popular. I use them all the time. I have several sitting by locally um, close to my office uh, or close to my desk just in case needed uh, for different reasons. Um, but as a reminder, I did mention that it's best not to use essential oils orally. Um, again, that's not a complete contraindication, but just to make sure you're working with an expert. Um, there are reports um, annually around uh, essential oils being utilized directly orally and often without being diluted, and, and I'll tell you what I mean by diluted in a moment, uh, but just using them either in water or swallowing them uh, neat uh, can lead to liver damage as well as kidney damage, but absolutely can have um, liver toxicity, and this is not something that sadly is uncommon uh, for individuals that, that have used um, oils um, directly orally. When using them topically, it is best to dilute them with a carrier oil. Um, what I mean by that is another um, inert oil, such as olive oil, sunflower, almond. Um, and you can imagine it's utilizing oils with oils is going to be a better dissolution process than utilizing essential oils with water. They're not going to mix. Um, so that's why it's recommended to use a carrier oil. Um, experts in, in aromatherapy, there's a book here. Um, Mindy Green is one of the authors, and no one pays me to promote this book by any means, but um, I have heard presentations by her. She did teach us in the fellowship program. Um, she's just one of many aromatherapists that I highly um, are highly regarded and I highly recommend. Um, but her recommendation is a one to two percent, and then not to go over a five percent um, essential oil concentration. Uh, there are instances where you may go upwards of a ten percent topical um, solution or topical application. But it really just becomes the fact that you could have a uh, topical reaction to, um, to the essential oil after that, and there may not be any additional benefit higher than that concentration. I would recommend using a small amount to test for allergic reaction, either on the inside, the arm, or somewhere else, but just to ensure that prior to administration on a larger part of the body that there is no um, allergic reaction. That also is meant to be for the carrier oil. So, for example, if you have someone who has an almond allergy, you would not want to use almond oil as the carrier oil with the essential oil um, as part of that. I can tell you I didn't necessarily believe that myself once before, um, and I learned the hard way. And uh, absolutely, that you can have topical reactions um, to essential oils. Using pure essential oils, I know that that's just the same as herbal products, so ensuring that it's a reputable source, um, that the manufacturer is very transparent in how they process their oils is really important. When uh, suspending essential oils or into the carrier oil, a good um, uh, sort of guidance to use is thinking about about 20 drops of essential oil is approximately one mil. As you know, the viscosity of each of those are very different, but that's a pretty good general um, recommendation. Beware of uh, photosensitivity, um, especially for citrus oils. Absolutely, they can have call sunburn if you're not very careful with those. 
And also being cautious um, during pregnancy is, is really important. Um, and I would not recommend you to, using those. As I said, Luna may need to hop on. Uh, next slide. There you go. Um, there are known risks for herb-drug interactions with common herbs, and there are many others that we'll talk about in a moment where it's a little less uh, unknown. But I think we all know that St. John's wort, at least if you, it, our, my pharmacy students certainly know over time that St. John's wort does likely of all the herbs probably have the highest risk of herb-drug interactions. It can drastically reduce concentrations of many prescription medications by inducing cytochrome P450 enzymes. And then golden seal or berberine, which is the active component within golden seal, can also increase concentrations of prescription medications. So just to use those um, very cautiously or avoid at all in individuals that are taking other medications. Uh, next slide. Uh, so there are, I'd say the highest category is the intermediate or unknown risks of <laughs> drug interactions with common herbs. Um, garlic is one of those that for a long time we felt probably had a much higher risk of herb drug interactions than what we know now. That doesn't mean it, it's benign by any means, but it's a very specific interaction and a little bit different than we thought. So. It is going to inhibit PGP, so any drugs that are metabolized by PGP is going to increase those concentrations. Curcumin or turmeric is a very commonly used herbs, herb, um, often for inflammatory type conditions of many, many uh, varieties. But there is a potential for increased medication, so this is very specific depending on the prescription medication. Um, echinacea, again, is one of those that's... Um, sort of all over the place, so I would just ensure that you evaluate its use alongside of prescription medications. There's also its, um, its mechanism of action of being an immunostimulator often has some concerns within um, cancer care. Um, green tea may have some uh, uh, increased concentrations with other medications. Kava kava, I would say, is used maybe less commonly um, now than it used to, and depends on the region of the of the country and the product. Um, but it is, at least from what we know, is likely okay with most medications. Elderberry is a little bit unknown, um, and then lemon balm. There is some data actually that I'll talk about in a moment um, that could have an effect on. Um, activation of specific medications and I think it is reasonable to talk about some very specific chemotherapeutic agents here um, that are fairly common and again please keep in mind if I can't answer your questions because I'm not a, a chemotherapy pharmacotherapy expert um, but I can find the information for you but tamoxifen is an example that uh, many of us know is utilized quite widely it does require activation to an active um, metabolite to, to, be, to provide its activity, and there are medications as well as herbs that can inhibit that activation. Um, SSRIs are an example of those that may inhibit the activation. And then there's some question around um, whether lemon balm does that as well, um, as well as golden seal. So any medications like tamoxifen that require um, activation to be fully effective, I would be cautious um, around using herbal medicines and at least do an evaluation. Next slide. Um, I could do really an entire talk around how do you assess herb drug interactions, but um, and pharmacologists and pharmacists, I would say, enjoy this probably more than other providers, but. If you have an interest in pharmacology, these will be interesting to you. So I'll just introduce very briefly about how we tend to evaluate herb-drug interactions in the literature so that when you do look at these, perhaps they are, um, you, you can understand them a little bit more about how we approach it. It's a little bit different than how we go about um, looking at prescription medications because, as you know, there's a very clear process for um, evaluation and submission of prescription medications to the FDA. 
that process does not exist with herbal products. So we ha often have to utilize what's available in databases as well as what's available in PubMed and what's published. So Natural Medicines Database, if you're a UNC affiliate, which I think many or all of you are, um, is available free to your use. Um, that is a very helpful, very comprehensive database, um, probably one I would recommend over any others. And it is referenced, so you can click on the reference and go directly to the citation to look up directly. I still tend to do a PubMed search if I'm really wanting to provide an accurate herb-drug interaction um, evaluation. Also looking at in vitro versus in vivo studies, um, oftentimes those don't correlate. I think that's probably obvious, but especially with herbal medications, oftentimes or herbal products, oftentimes there'll be in vitro data in cell systems that don't mimic what we see in people. So ideally what we do is look at how would these um, herb products affect um, concentrations in healthy volunteers. So here's an example, and on the next slide, I'll show you how we do that. So next slide. So this is kind of busy, and you guys can step back and look at this again, but I thought it was a pretty reasonable explanation of how we, how these the specific type of studies are done in healthy volunteers. So what happens, let's say we have a, um, an herb of interest, we'll just say um, uh, St. John's wort as an example. I tend to use that one quite often because it's been studied quite a bit. So you'll get a group of healthy volunteer um, individuals, and you'll administer the medications that you'll see are medications and, and substances that you'll see listed on the left. So midazolam caffeine, warfarin, and meprazolam digoxin is an example of what we call um, a cocktail or a probe cocktail. And those medications or substances are representations of specific cytochrome P450 enzymes or drug transporters. And digoxin here is represented, um, represents PGP um, metabolism, for example, or transport of PGP. So we're, in essence, using a marker for how the herbal product might have an effect upon cytochrome P450 enzymes by indirectly looking at how does that herb affect the concentration of these medications and substances. Um, so what will happen is you'll get this cocktail or a combination of uh, medication and substances to a healthy volunteer. You'll get concentrations of each of those. And then you'll provide a minute oral, typically oral administration of the dietary supplement of interest to that same healthy volunteer for a period of seven to 14 days. And then at the end of that steady state period, um, you'll repeat administration of those um, prescription medication substances and then get concentrations on each of those. So in essence, what you're doing is comparing the concentrations, for example, of midazolam after the administration of the dietary supplement to the concentration of the dazolam prior to administration of the dietary supplement, and you can see the change over time. So again, it is an indirect way to evaluate a dietary supplement's effect on the enzyme, but it is a fairly common and an FDA-approved um, approach to how we might evaluate cytochrome P450 interactions as well as drug transporter interactions. Probably a lot more than many of you wanted to know, but I thought it was important to understand how to how to look at these. Next slide. I'm going to skip over this because I do want to make sure we have a, a sufficient time to talk about um, to talk about THC and CBD, but um, just to know that there are other resources as well to refer to. Next slide. Um, again, some other databases as well as reputable distributors. I'll invite you all to look at at your leisure, um, but very great resources to utilize. Next slide. All right. And just a reminder to our audience, don't feel like you have to be uh, writing down all of those links. Those are all on the page for Dr. Corbett's presentation. All those links are included in the uh, documents. All right. So essential oils. A, should be diluted with a carrier oil. B, can be safely used orally, diluted with in water. Or C, have well-known herb-drug interactions. 
So uh, again, pick the best one of the three. A should be diluted with a carrier oil. B can be safely used orally, diluted in water, or C have well-known herb drug interactions. And take about five more seconds if you haven't already had a chance to uh, answer this poll. Dr. Corbett, how are they doing? Looks great. You guys got it. Absolutely. So I think it's clear that we know essential oils need to be diluted in your carrier oil. Um, I would not recommend them being used orally, diluted in water. Um, and then we actually don't have a lot of information about the herb drug interactions with essential oils. So thank you. That's great. All right. Um, so I think, you know, many of you or all of you perhaps work in cancer care and we've talked a little bit about the fact that we know a lot of cancer patients do utilize dietary supplements. Um, in a recent survey by, and I don't know if Gary's on the phone or not, but Gary Asher's one of our, one of, um, our uh, family medicine physicians who um, does have a consultation in, at Weinberger for integrative health and cancer patients. Um, one of my teachers for sure, but he um, has a publication just a few years ago um, that he found about 60% of, of use among dietary supplement use among cancer patients during treatment, and about 18% of those were on herbal supplements of some type. The most common was omega-3 fatty acids or fish oils. That's not terribly uncommon in the general population. Um, green tea was also fairly, the most common herb. And interestingly, about 75% of them did seek professional advice. What I thought was the most interesting component was those individuals that sought out consultation from integrative health providers specifically actually had increased use of dietary supplements. Um, so you might think that by asking questions or engaging with providers that are familiar with integrative health, they might um, discourage dietary supplements, but actually it seemed to be the latter in this situation that there was a safer um, use and recommendation. Next slide. Um, again, not an exhaustive list, but I did want to make sure you all knew of some common dietary supplements used by cancer patients. And I know there's some very specific requests around cannabinoids. So in our next few minutes, we're going to focus a little bit on uh, cannabinoids, and of course, if there's additional information, I'm happy to uh, follow up around that, about that later. Uh, next slide. We'll go through these pretty quick. I think all of us know cannabis has been around for thousands and thousands of years as a plant medicinally, um, originally used in Chinese medicine, likely originally used in Chinese medicine, but for sure in Chinese medicine over 5,000 years ago. Uh, next slide. Um, and you can click through the next click, Tim, as well. There you go. Um, so cannabis is a, is a common term, um, sort of an umbrella term that we often use for many different types of products or substances. So cannabis sativa is the most common um, plant name. There are others, uh, cannabis in the indica, for example. But for today, we'll just be referring to cannabis sativa. So cannabis sativa is a plant itself. Marijuana is often the term utilized for the THC-based component. And then hemp is um, another term that you've probably heard even more often. Um, and that is also tended to be um, described as the plant itself that has very, very small amount of THC or the component of cannabis that causes the psychoactive high effect. Next slide. Um, you can go through this one, Tim. Next slide. So what's often a misnomer or misunderstood is THC versus CBD. Um, so marijuana, um, marijuana actually has uh, hundreds of cannabinoids and cannabidiol or CBD as we've often heard it called or CBD oil is just one of the cannabinoids within this specific plant. Um, it's just the one that we tend to talk about and there's actually different 
um, CB cannabidiols as well, so not to get into a lot of pharmacology and specifics, and some of which I'm not even clear on. Um, but CBD is what we know of as um, the primary component in CBD oil or the products of CBD oil. Um, there's very little, and in fact, it's legally, um, you could not have any more than 0.3% of THC within a CBD oil product. And then probably what you're more familiar with, uh, which uh, is often used for recreational purposes, is THC or delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. Um, it's a part of the plant that gives you the high feeling. There's also pharmaceutical agents, which I'll mention in a moment. And then there's hemp oil, which is also very separate. It's an oil that's extracted from the seeds of the plant um, that's often used in cooking and topically for lots of reasons. Uh, next slide. I'm not going to talk a lot about regulation. It gets really complex. This uh, fully legalization in 23 states could have changed overnight. I didn't check today. Um, but we do know that THC is fully legal in many states within the U.S. It's a very complex regulation. Um, whether it is decriminalized or not is also a question. Um, the DISA Global Solutions is an example, is, a, I think, a great resource and website that provides fairly up-to-date approval. Um, of THC within the U.S. CBD is still, oil is still, unless something happened again overnight, is still a federal Schedule 5 substance, very complex regulation. It's actually not approved as a dietary supplement and is not approved for anything um, within the U.S. Um, the only CBD, oil, pure CBD oil approved um, pharmaceutical agent is, is Epidiolex. It's um, currently FDA approved for seizures, but it's also studied in other indications. Next slide. Here are some examples of different uh, prescription products that I mentioned uh, previously. The Sativex Marinol Sesamet has some component of THC. Sativex also has CBD within it, so those are going to be prescription products. Sativex, last I checked, is still not FDA approved within the U.S., but is utilized in other countries. I'll often refer to these OTC slash recreational products or CBD oil as over-the-counter because um, technically that is where it's sold. And then we know that there's also marijuana that's used recreationally. Lots of different formulations. You can have oral, solid oral dosage forms, often encapsulated oils, oral sprays, liquids, um, as well as topical products. Next slide. Many, many indications for THC as well as CBD. Some of these have more um, data than others, and often it's the prescription medications that are going to have more comprehensive data than the more recreational OTC, but there's lots of um, indications for both of these, as is listed here. Next slide. I was asked to at least briefly mention about topical cannabinoids. Some of you may have data that I'm not as, I'm not as aware of, but I don't know of any comprehensive and what I mean by topical does not mean oil, mucosal sprays, for example, but more of the creams or gels um, that are rubbed on the skin topically, most likely for pain, um, osteoarthritis. There is some data for wounds. There's topical animal products as well. Um, I don't know of any comprehensive data around these, but I can say that I'm hoping to look at this more carefully myself in the next um, year or so. Next slide. Not surprising, as with other products, there is a risk for herb drug interactions. Um, if you guys have want to know specifics, I'm happy to send that information out as well. But for both THC products as well as CBD products, there is a, a risk for herb drug interactions. It also depends on the product, the strength of the product, um, what it specifically is in the product itself. So. There's really just a lot of things um, that would have to be known about the product, as well as the concomitant medications that the patient plans to take. Next slide. I think we're uh, next to the last slide here, but just like with any other herbal medications, it is um, encouraged to ensure that the product that you're using, the THC or CBD-based product, if it is one of the um, OTC-type products, that there is um, transparent information from the manufacturer around what is actually in the product. 
you might often hear the term full spectrum. So it's going to, um, those manufacturers would provide a certificate of analysis. Sometimes they're very obvious on their websites. Sometimes they have to be requested. And it will tell you of all the cannabidiols and terpenes and other components of the product, what specifically is in there, as well as evaluating for absence um, or minimization of heavy metals is very important. Consumer Lab does have a great review on um, some OTC CBD oil products that I would recommend. Next slide. And then finally, none of these people, again, pay me to promote their CBD oil products, but I get this question probably once a week from someone. Um, so there's lots of av availability of products around the CBD oil or CV sciences, the one the picture in the very bottom middle. It's probably one many of you have seen around. Um, I would, I've seen the certificate of analysis. It is one that I do think is very transparent about what's in their product. And I think that's our last slide. All right. We do have uh, one more question for you. And then uh, if you want to start formulating your questions to submit to Dr. Corbett, that'll be our, our next slide. Uh, but first, the medicinal plant cannabis sativa a contains THC in a less than 0.3% concentration. B contains CBD, which gives you a high feeling. C contains hundreds of cannabinoids. Or D has little potential for herb drug interactions. So go ahead and, and pick which of those four options if you're texting A, B, C, or D. And then again, in just a minute, you can be ready to submit your questions. All right, Dr. Corbett, how are they doing? Great. And I can see where this one might be a little tricky. It wasn't intended mm -hmm. to be. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so it looks great. Yeah, so it absolutely, as I said, the cannabis sativa plant has hundreds of cannabinoids, many of which we have not even studied. Um, there is actually a potential for herb drug interactions, so that would not be the case. The THC is actually the component that gives you the high feeling. And then the cannabis sativa plant, traditionally does have THC present in it. Um, if, if the plant is grown to be specifically having CBD in it um, or, or to be concentrated with CBD, then that would that product that is developed from that plant would need to have less than 0.3% um, THC. So that one was perhaps a little tricky. Great. Well, uh, we do now have a an opportunity for our guests to ask questions. So uh, go, please, if you'll go ahead and post your questions and then we'll put those up. Um, and what I'm actually going to, oh, we've already got a question, good. So um, here we go. And let's see that, are there any specific disease guidelines for the use of, for the safe use of dietary supplements? I'm not sure how to answer that question. Um, maybe they could elaborate a little bit. Like, are there, I'm not sure where, what that exactly means. I don't know if it means disease guidelines or for cancer therapy specifically. Gotcha. So if we could ask the, uh, the audience member who shared that question, to uh, go ahead and uh, elaborate a little bit, and we can uh, address that after after we get that. And we do have more questions coming in. Yeah, and I, I will say in general, I don't know of any, you know, like we have guidelines for hypertension or hyperlipidemia or diabetes. I don't know of any that are specific for all dietary supplements, um, but I can for sure try and um, determine some papers that I might refer to you all or references. Gotcha. That'd be great. All right. So can CBD oil uh, be used on sickle cell patients? Um, I don't know. I guess that's assuming um, oil as in oral for pain management is my assumption. I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know of any data specifically there could be in sickle cell patients. There is some data in pain management and it did say CBD specifically, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, what I would ask specifically is what the other medications are and evaluating any risk for herb drug interactions. Um, there could be some small amount of data that 
I'm just not aware of. But I, the biggest question for me there would be um, herb drug interaction potential. Great, great, thank you. And uh, next question, uh, what are the key essential oils that you would recommend for treatment of cancer or cancer therapy induced side effects? Oh, wow. Um, this is just me speaking. I'm not sure of any data. There, there is some data. Um, there's data with lavender around anxiety, post-surgical. In fact, there's a pretty large um, study looking at lavender oils and pain uh, post-surgical. There probably, if any others know the answer to any data out there, please speak up. Um, I will say lavender essential oil is fairly common to use for calming and anxiety. Um, I know mostly the herbal oral products. I'm not really thinking of any other specifically for essential oils, but I could I could look it up and let you know. Okay, great, great. And Dr. Corbett is going to post some uh, answer some of these uh, answers to questions that we don't have time for. We've gotten several questions. Thank you all so much. We'll get to a few more of these now, and then she'll take some of the others online because we'll be wrapping up in just a few minutes here. Uh, just for clarification, that, that question on sickle cell was yes for pain crisis in sickle cell. Okay. Uh, and uh, let's see, here's another one. Um, do patients with mental bipolar disorder use CBD oil? Is that something that's effective, has been found to be effective? I, I'm not sure about bipolar specifically. There is a small amount of data in anxiety as well as in depression with, this, with a CBD sort of over-the-counter product. Um, it, it again, it's a very small amount of data. Um, now, Epidiolex specifically, uh, honestly can't recall if there's any data on depression. I do not know of any with bipolar specifically. Um, but I, I would look up Epidiolex specifically. Um, and again, I don't know of any with the over-the-counter um, CBD oil products. My biggest question there again would be, assuring that there's no herb drug interactions because there is a risk for interactions. Gotcha. Um, do you have a typical dose that you recommend for patients with CBD oil? Well, that's a tough one. So we could talk <laughs> about this for days. Um, I will, let me just give you general guidance around what we see as where most of the data is, which is with Epidiolex, is in the hundreds of milligrams per dose. Um, and again, that's going to be a synthetic manufactured CBD oil. So this is a very purified CBD oil product. Most of the over-the-counter CBD oil products start at one, two and a half, five, ten milligrams. Some go upwards of 50 to 60 milligrams. There may be 100 milligrams product out there. I'm, I'm just not thinking about it off the top of my head. So we're talking about dress fold changes higher doses with Epidiolex, you, that was, again, FDA approved to treat very specific types of seizures as compared to these 5 to 10 milligram per dose, often twice a day dose products that are used over the counter. What I will say is if the OTC products are used, I would start at the lowest dose possible to ensure to people tolerate it um, and then escalate to there. I can tell you most of the products that I've seen and the data that I've seen on their websites, they do provide, the reputable products that I've seen do provide very reasonable doses um, and also recommend starting at, you know, two and a half, five milligrams, single doses a day. And it also depends on the indication. So that's really, really complex question. Um, Anywhere, again, from 5 milligrams up to 200 milligrams a day will depend on the product. And again, when I'm saying this, this is very, very little amount of data around any of this, um, these indications. So a lot of what consumers are using for CBD oil, um, I'm not saying I wouldn't use it. I, I think it has some fantastic potential when used safely and used with re reputable products, but it's, it's really based on a very small amount of information. 
Great, and great questions. Thank you so much to our audience. Uh, because we are running out of time, we're going to take this last question, and then again, we'll share the rest of your questions with Dr. Corbett and make the answers available online. So last question, are there differences in CBD drug interaction risks between adults and children? Um, I mean, there's, there's diff I'm trying to answer this concisely, but yeah. There's differences in um, drug pharmacology in children versus adults, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So that's a very large question. Um, I would say I would first consider the concomitant medication and um, understanding how that medication acts in a child versus an adult. Usually children above adolescent age have a fairly well-established metabolism by that point, as in metabolism of medications and substances. So usually beyond that age, it should be a fairly equivalent interaction potential. But very small children, I, I wouldn't even recommend utilization of any dietary supplements in very small children anyway for safety reasons. Um, but as far as the pharmacology, after about adolescent age, it tends to be fairly similar. Of course, there's other special populations that you know, we haven't even talked about, such as pregnancy, um, that also are quite different. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. And again, we will share the rest of those. Sorry, I popped up my uh, Apple screen there while I was trying to uh, make some adjustments. We want to say thank you. We want to say thank you to the over 200 people who joined us today from all over North Carolina and maybe beyond. We know these are trying times, and thank you for making time out of your day to, to join Dr. Cor Corbett here. Uh, we want to thank the North Carolina General Assembly for their generous support of the Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center and the University Cancer Research Fund. We want to thank uh, Mary King, Veneranda Obore, and John Powell for all of the work that they do for each and every one of our lectures.